You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever you are, whenever you are listening to this podcast. I just want to say thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in each week um, and supporting the podcast. Really means a lot. And I know there's so many podcasts out there. And uh, if you're new here and if you're here for Doug Jones, who's a brilliant actor um, and a great guest, which you're going to love, uh, hopefully you'll stick around and listen to other guests and subscribe. Um, you could follow us. Uh, where can they follow us, Ryan? At Inside of You Pod on Twitter and at Inside of You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. There you go. It's yeah. right It's right there. It's very easy. And you can watch us on YouTube. You can watch the videos, like them. And what's really important is if you write a review. That really means a lot. Helps so much. Uh, quickly, I want to just mention a, uh, a, a rescue that I'm part of. It's called the Animal Rescue Mission. Um, they rescue, rehab, and find forever homes for abused and neglected animals. And uh, my good friend Shira runs that, and she's a beautiful soul, and they really help a lot of animals. Go to www.theanimalrescuemission.org to donate. That would be nice of you. Also, if you uh, want to join Patreon, Patreon support the podcast in many ways. Go to patreon.com slash inside of you, and I'll send you a message after you join. And uh, there's lots of tiers, and there's a top tier where I send packages to you, and the YouTube with me live where you ask me questions, and there's just, it's a bunch of fun. Go to patreon.com slash inside of you also if you want any cool merch go to the inside of you online store tons of smallville stuff tons of inside of you stuff go to the inside of you online store uh that's always rocking we got a lot of new stuff uh, i'll be in raleigh this weekend i'm doing a smallville nights with tom welling and signing autographs so get there it's for galaxy con um this coming weekend and i'll be in boston august 12th weekend with Tom doing a Smallville Nights and all that stuff and signing autographs. Uh, today's guest is, uh, I, I just loved having him on, mm -hmm. Ryan. He mm -hmm. was, um, you know, so open about his upbringing, his life, acting, working with prosthetics, um, working in huge movies, mm -hmm. huge movies, and how he doesn't get, um, what's the word, claustrophobic. Mm hmm and, and some of those, you know, like, um, what's the movie? Shape of Water. Shape of Water. And mm -hmm. I'm like, how do you do that? I can't. I tried to, They tried to do a, mm -hmm. a mask on me once, like a mold of my head, and I freaked out. I freaked out. Is it there? No, no. it's not oh. that one. No. But <laughs> it was another one. This is the one that Ryan was looking at. It's a That's a helmet. But this was a mold of my yeah. head. And uh, by the way, it's crazy. Uh, we'll get right into Doug Jones after this. But I, I, I was having some anxiety, bad anxiety, and I got on these meds. They were the they they did not work. It tells you that look, not all meds are going to work for anxiety. It, my anxiety was through the roof after this. It negative thoughts. I felt horrible. I couldn't be around people. I had to get off them. It was terrible. So just know that if you know your psychiatrist or whatever gets you on meds, not all of them work. So it's a trial and error. It's sort of like you know you test one, and if you have major problems, you call your guy right away and say, "Look, I'm not feeling well." And, and boy, uh, my friends, we had a 50th gathering for my birthday at Buca de Beppo, mm -hmm. and they hooked it up in the back room. And on the way there, I, I got there, and I thought I was going to pass out, and I almost just walked away. And the whole night was horrible. Um, I told everybody I was having horrible anxiety and I, I played it off, but, but I was miserable. I was certainly miserable. And, uh, just to let you know, that was a side effect and it happens and, uh, I'm, I'm doing much better now, but it was rough, Ryan. I'm sorry for interrupting that with my phone, but that's okay. I, I just <laughs> kept going. I'm glad you're okay. Yeah. I texted you and I told you how yeah. shitty I was feeling. It was, it was overwhelming to the point where i'm like i can't do this podcast anymore i, I can't do i can't do this i can't yeah. i just want to move i want to get away from it all i can't be around anything i can't and i was like whoa 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 buddy rewind and then there's better help better help .com. <laughs> great segue you know uh we can get into that uh later but look let's uh let's do this right now i just wanted to let you know how i was feeling and uh, let you know what's going on with me and the podcast and animal rescue mission and all that stuff. I hope you bared with me and let's just get into it. Thanks for all the support. Let's get inside of Doug Jones. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. 
Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. First of all, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for having what me. What a treat. We've met a couple times yes. at conventions and things like that. And mm -hmm. I was always like, this guy's extraordinary. No, no. Yeah, I always felt like you were extraordinary. You're an extraordinary individual. You have an extraordinary career. Mm. Because it probably didn't go the way you thought it would go. Hell it went no. in a, ve <laughs> a very different way. But uh, f wait, you said you were nervous to be on my show. That's weird. I'm always nervous to interview guests. Are you really? Oh, yeah. I always do. I'm just like, I don't know how it's going to go. You you appear so comfortable. Uh, uh, your show does a deep dive that uh, that is terrifying. Really? Yes. Well, we, you know, it's, it, 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 I think inadvertent is the word. I, I don't, I don't try to get like inside. I mean, I do. Well, that's the name of the show. I do. It's a very but, intimate but, title, by the way. But my, it is, right? I know. <laughs> you know, what's funny is I have these sweatshirts and, uh, that my producer made and, and he didn't put with Michael Rosenbaum. It just says inside of you. Right. So at a Starbucks, <laughs> people are like, what the fuck? What is he doing? Should that? I put that on your cup? What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, look, the point is to have a real conversation. People don't want to hear conversations with actors about, like, you know, all the fluff. Or going down the IMDb list. Perfect. Oh, you were in John Dyson, Dan. What was that like? Well, w worst interview ever. But we, <laughs> but I, I talk about that. It's like, you know, I, I go to Wiki. I go to all these things. But, like, really, it's about your journey. Mm -hmm. And it's about who you are. And that's, mm -hmm. that's all it is. I mean, it's like. I've had guests that don't talk very much. We've had guests that really? talk a lot, which is great. Right. Are mm -hmm. you a talker? More than I should be, yeah because when i get started on a story it's like you know that's a train that it's hard to stop <laughs> so i'm sorry so how, <laughs> careful what you open no, up no no i like it how many credits would you say you have because I, I know I, I recently saw you in what we do in the shadows that yeah. was the most recent which because i know you're in star trek discovery yeah. you know you've done hellboy and well, i mean there's shape of water and uh mimic and hocus pocus and i mean the list goes on pan's labyrinth and you've done so many things mm. that i mean it's you have a you have an illustrious career well and i, I thank you I, but it, i wouldn't say it's because i'm good it's because i'm old and i've had time to rack them up that's it that's it <laughs> that's it i i beg to differ my friend i mean i've heard i, I think what you have done is much harder than your typical actor well, harder. I don't know. You know, it's uh, hard and difficult is all, those are relative terms really, aren't they? I, I, aren't they? Because I, <laughs> I guess so. I, any actor that takes on a character is going to take, it has their difficulties in finding that character and making them come through their, their being, whatever it is. So whether it's a guy in a t-shirt and jeans with heavy emotional trauma, that's what you're playing. Right. Or whether it's a creature in rubber bits from head to toe and you're crawling on all fours, that's the guy that's difficulties, different types. It just seems like when you're doing a, and we'll get into this, but like, it seems like when you're doing a creature or uh you know some you know character in a movie and you have prosthetics on you have all these things on it feels like and especially if you don't speak a lot it you have to it's your body that expresses all these things your your mm. emotions and things and things have to come right. out and right. it just seems like that's harder right. you know if you have lines you could say some lines and people go oh that's sad that his brother died <laughs> right, right, right. but when you have to mote all this shit right i mean doesn't that don't you have to work harder you think we, yeah sure mm, well it, it, you have to work different maybe not harder um I believe that dialogue comes in uh, visuals and verbal, right? Right. And we all we all speak it every day, but we're just not as we're not so aware of the visuals uh, that we're giving. So when you are playing a creature that that has no written verbal dialogue lines, uh, you have tons of dialogue that is visual to get a point across, to get an emotion across, to get a relationship across. Uh, the Shape of Water is probably the most the, the most near and dear to me as far as the nonverbal characters that I've played. Right. The amphibian man in that didn't speak a word. He was an animal from the wild yeah. and he's falling in love with a mute woman. So she didn't speak either. So the two of us had to find Good Lord. a completely on screen language with each other that the audience would buy. Right. Yeah. So, so, so I've, I, I've had tons of dialogue over the years, whether it's, whether it's spoken or shown. Right. But you know, we'll get into this again, shape of water, but I know that uh, the director, I always mess his name up. Guillermo del Toro. Guillermo del Toro. <laughs> Guillermo del Toro, who I love. I've, I've heard everything over there. Oh, you must, what's it like working with Guillermo del What's up with Guillermo del Toro? <laughs> um, but he said something to you in The Shape of Water before you started filming. Yes. I saw an interview with you. Oh, okay. And he said something to you which sounds pretty frightening, but it's like, 
What, you, what did he say to you? To, Doggy, to get, you would be the romantic leading man of this movie. Is that the way you're talking about? Yep, exactly. <laughs> and right, and I'm thinking like, you just told me about this being a fish person. So that's going to be, <laughs> there's a tall order, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, but then but the next breath, I thought to myself, Guillermo del Toro is the one director who can pull this off. As right. far as like writing it and, and guiding me through it. And he sure did. But didn't he say something like, you're playing an animal and, uh, but you have to be, we have to love you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, I have to, the audience has to, has to buy that this woman is falling in love with me. Uh, so I have to have a, ro a romance to me. I have to have a, a sexy look. The, the look of the amphibian man went through a year of tweaks and changes and color changes and shape changes. The ass and the lips were the two areas on the fish man that were the most retooled over the over really the, they like, wanted you to have a nice ass <laughs> oh gosh yeah and i'll tell you what uh <laughs> i knew that they pulled that off uh it was glued onto me by the way it wasn't my ass i had to right. give it back every day but but <laughs> but i knew i knew the ass was working when we're all sitting on our set chairs you know between shot setups and i stand up to walk away and octavia spencer says mm. I, that, that, <laughs> that's when I knew that we pulled it off. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was it. <laughs> yeah. How many times did you have to? <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Huh. I know, right? Ooh, yeah. Damn. Right, right, right. Amphibia. She, she's given several interviews since then uh, addressing that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How long did you film that movie, by the way? We were doing about three months, I think. Three yeah, months. Yeah, three months. But yeah. you, how many times did you have to get in that costume to test it out? The prosthetics beforehand. beforehand. Oh, the, yeah. Uh, in, any of the roles I've done in heavy prosthetics, you do several fittings ahead of time. Like, you know, maybe like you start doing that months beforehand. So I, oh, I lost count, you know. And it might be one piece at a time. Like, Doug, we need to come in. This neck piece isn't working. Can you come in and we have to fit this one bit on? Uh, so the full body head to head to toe test, it comes later, closer to the production. All right. Uh, it, there, it, the Academy uh, uh, Museum that's the that opened up in the last year, has a big display of the amphibian man from it's a full size it is my actual suit one of my actual suits from the movie that has been now reconstructed onto a dummy right uh not this dummy the different <laughs> dummy and um and it's in a it's in a glass case in the museum with a, a, a picture and a plaque down there that ex ex describes what you're looking at with a photo of me in one of my early fittings and it was kind of me without the head on kind of doing a, a pose to to test out how the arms and legs move the fittings were uh, were so particular and so precise that they because because any anywhere any direction you move or bend th there shouldn't be a wrinkle that says ah, it's a rubber suit right right so that's what they have to like tweak and fine tune and so it, so getting it on is like it takes three grown adults to go <laughs> for you know thirty minutes Jeez to get that ass. yeah to get to get the suit on and then you have glued on parts too so. Like the difference between a suit and a makeup is a suit you slip on, zip up the back, and makeup you either glue or paint on the skin. Right. So uh, that was a combination of both. So I just, see this. I feel like such a what's the right term to use <laughs> is I can't say pussy. No. <laughs> can't say that anymore. I can't. I can't say. I feel wussy. Like Use the W. How about a, yeah, I have, yeah? How about a wussy? Yeah, yeah. That's what I can say. That <laughs> well, here I'm suggesting you call yourself a wussy. That's terrible. I wouldn't say that. Well, I, I feel like that because you know I, like I had to shave my head for seven years, and uh, it was and two, that gets tiresome. And doesn't two it? and a half hours in the makeup trailer, and every day, and you know they had to put a lot of makeup on me, and mm -hmm. then I just turned down a role because I didn't want to wear a prosthetic for because I just I I I'm claustrophobic. Mm -hmm. I'm all these things. Sure, but I feel like such a wuss because. Mm. Do you even get scared? Do you get claustrophobic? No. Nothing. No. You've never been claustrophobic in a costume. Mm -mm. All right, but that's. It. <clears throat> but you can't control when or when it doesn't happen. You know, when or, uh, I did a movie called The Time Machine. It was a, rem machine. a, re a remake of the 1961. Uh, H.G. Wells. Yes. yes. Uh, and it was directed by Simon Wells, who was uh, H.G.'s like grandson, I think um we had, we had a legacy you know on set with us it was great but i played one of the uh one of the uh, underground dweller um what were we called the uh uh help me <laughs> no uh think the, about it the Mor I, Morlocks, Morlocks. Mo I was one of the Morlocks. Morlocks. Yes. Like Ryan would know what the fuck that is. I know. I'm, I'm tapping. Ryan, going, what is me? it? Uh, help me. Mo Morlocks. <laughs> Morlocks. We got it. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> yeah, Google duty. Inside of you is brought to you by Freedom Grooming. Uh, this is something I wish I had when I was bald. And so to all the bald people out there, this is for you. 
Talk about a product that is so wonderful that it avoids nicks and cuts and uh, irritation or ingrown hairs. Freedom Grooming has created the Flex Series Electric Shaver, which is uniquely designed to flex and contour the curve of your head for a smoother, faster, and safer shave without the risk of nicks, cuts, irritation, or ingrowns. Get the smoothest shave of your life. Flexible blades contour to the shape of your head for a baby smooth shave every time. Shave 50% more hair in a single stroke compared to traditional razors. Expect shave times of 2 to 3 minutes, not 10 to 15. And never cut yourself shaving again. The Flex Series Safeguard technology means no nicks, no ingrown hairs, no problems. And the Flex Series waterproof design means you can shave in the shower with or without shaving cream, shave wet, or shave dry. It's pretty incredible. It's an incredible product. Uh, like I said, I mean, I, look, I, I, was, I was bald for seven years, and I remember cutting them cutting my head when they shaved my head every day. I can't say the razor I used, but it used to nicks and ingrowns and blood, and I just, I needed something like this. This is a fantastic product, the Flex Series Electric Shaver. Since even the sharpest blades dull with use, Freedom created the Close Shave Plan. With the Close Shave Plan, you'll never run out of fresh, sharp blades delivered to your door every six weeks with free shipping. All active Close Shave Plan members are upgraded to a lifetime warranty, and it's completely customizable. Adjust, skip, or cancel your plan anytime. And Freedom Grooming has over 10,000 five-star reviews. So thank you for being a loyal listener, and uh, we're partnering with Freedom to give you an exclusive 20% off when you go to freedomgrooming.com slash inside. That's freedomgrooming.com slash inside. You're going to need this product, folks. Inside of You is brought to you by Shopify. We love our Shopify. Uh, I have a Shopify account. It's where all my merch is for the Inside of You online store. I do not know what I would do without Shopify. I would not have a store. They make it so easy, so simple. Uh, it's just an amazing, amazing thing. Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big businesses. So upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. You know what's great about Shopify is, Ryan, I know how products are doing. I know how they're selling. I know how much I'm making this month. I know what the dud products are. It gives me just an accurate, up-to-date look at how things are going on my store. Uh, I really don't know what I would do without Shopify. Um, look, this podcast, we started selling uh, you know, a T-shirt, and now I have 30, 40 items, and I can I could even grow. I mean, we have so many items to sell thanks to Shopify. Uh, we're selling a lot. Uh, like mine, Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale, reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. Gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. It's more than a store. Shopify grows with you. This is Possibility powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash inside, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash inside right now. Shopify.com slash inside. Anyway, uh, to why, why did I break? I see uh, this is what's because happening Because you were warned that we were talking about, is there ever an instance that you got claustrophobic? Yeah, and you said yeah, it yeah. comes and goes. Okay, okay. So there were a ton of Morlocks in the movie. I was the only actor. The rest of them were all stuntmen. And uh, so, um, and a lot of these, you know, there were two types of Morlocks, the skinny ones that were shooting darts at, at the Eloy people, and then the big big hunter Morlocks that came up and would grab them. Once they were spiked in the neck, they would grab them and, and take them back down underground. Well, the big, the big hunter Morlocks were these... I mean, these are stunt stunt guys who had you know dived out of four story buildings that are on fire. They've crashed cars over cliffs, and now they put this thing on them. And you didn't every every so often, like during the early days, they were kind of like testing these guys. And they had me come in 
to kind of like, because I was the only one who had done this for, you know, decades before. Right. And they were like, you know, can, can you just kind of help guide everybody? Because there's some first timers here. And to see a big guy like freak out and go like, get this off me, get this off me. Really? You just, just can't control. You can't control when it's going to happen. And, and it, how it, do you it, calm it, him down? Well, it doesn't make you a wussy. It doesn't make you a wussy. It doesn't. Okay, thank it, you. Not, no, it really doesn't because uh, because there's all kinds of psychological backstory that, that leads you to that moment where you're having a freak out because there's something around your face. You, and you, you, you don't have time to delve into that. <laughs> let's, let's have a therapy session before we do this movie. Jeez. You don't have time. So, you know, so some, some of the guys were like, you know, this has been great, but I'm out of here. You know? Really? They quit? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Can, yeah. Cannot do it. Yeah. You've seen people get up and leave. That particular production, just because there were so many, uh, but other, otherwise, they, you can, uh, you, you vet your, your, your candidates ahead of time before you bring them in. You know, you'll yeah. know, you, know you, you find guys who have, who, or, or ladies who have worn rubber bits before and are used to it and comfortable with it. They tried putting it, they had to put a rubber mold over my head, a head, a full face mold. Mm -hmm. head you've mm -hmm. done many of these like, like yeah, a, a, yeah. a life cast when they're yeah yeah doing cast an impression of, your head. Impression of you uh-huh and you know it's like painting that blue stuff on you yeah, and it, then also, alginate it, yeah yes and then it gets hard it hardens and then they plaster over that and yeah. about eight minutes in, i go <sighs> yeah not through your mouth you guys didn't. guys <laughs> um how, how long how long do we have left goes, uh we have about 10 more minutes of this and then we have to do this and i go I don't think I could do this. I don't think I could do it. And they go, well, just try to breathe, try to breathe. And right. and they got me through it. And I was just like, I'm getting nervous. Like even getting, talking about just it, just talking about it. it. <laughs> what is that? Do you think there's some psychological thing connected? Like you said, maybe to that, maybe yeah. something, some trauma I had that I can't be in a, or, or it could be also a fear of death. Uh, uh, because, um, you know, when you think of being buried, after you're dead, your body mm. going under, and if you're not okay with like where your soul will go after you're dead, maybe that's a terrifying thought, you know. And so here you are being encased, like a mu you mummified, really, right. in that moment, and you have to trust that the people working on you will take it off. That's right. what I've learned is that you have to trust it's coming off at the end of the day, or it's coming off in a few twenty minutes when this life cast is done. I also find that it helps if uh, someone just touches my hand every so often, let them remind me that they're there, right. <laughs> Even when I'm in a dentist chair, right, getting worked on, when like you know, the, the pain and, and anguish of having things drilled and filled and ripped out and replaced or whatever they yeah. do, oh, the older I get, my the, my teeth are rotting out of my head. So I've been in, <laughs> I've been in a lot. I find myself if I if I hold my own hands in the dental chair, I'm I do much better. Just holding my own hands that way, I can I can kind of caress my my own. Did you ever explain to them when they're looking at you going like this, or you just said it, no? It helps me. It just <laughs> it just helps me. So you're more fearful of the dentist chair. Oh yeah. Than you are getting hours of prosthetics on oh, you. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Holy yeah, yeah. shit! Yeah. But the prosthetic process probably has helped me with my dental fears. Uh, I can yeah. you know because I I mm -hmm, I avoided the dental chair for a long time. <laughs> It's always that moment where I'm like, that just is fine. This is fine. And then all of a sudden that nerve, you hit a nerve. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, my God. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right? Yeah. It's just the worst. And mm -hmm. then you're then you're a mm -hmm. it, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I know what you mean. <laughs> Let's go back because I love that you're you're from Indiana. No, originally. Yeah, Do you that's... know I'm from Indiana? Uh no. I grew up in a small town called Newburgh near Evansville, Indiana. Oh, down south. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you're in Evan you're in Indianapolis. Indianapolis. Right. 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 Yeah. And uh so you grew up in Indiana. What was it like growing up? Little Doug Jones. Mm. What were you into? What were you getting into in Indiana? <laughs> Flashlight tag. Remember oh. that? Catching fireflies. Well, catching fireflies. On an for August sure. uh yeah. dusk. Oh, the summer when the summertime came and the warm, humid and the fireflies were out. They were so easy to catch, too. Yeah. Hoop. Put them in a jar. Put them in a and jar. Like a little flashlight. Yeah, they didn't last forever, unfortunately, did they? No, they yeah. didn't. Mm. But, um, <laughs> yeah. But, like, yeah. No, I, I'm from that era of going outside and playing until the streetlights come on, uh, you know, kind of thing where you didn't have – no one – we didn't have cell phones. We didn't know what that even was. Right. Um, you know, you, you, weren't, uh, you weren't looking at a screen all day. You were outside playing in the mud and, you know, and your parents – let just I walked to school by myself. Yeah, me and, too. Yeah, you know. Were you popular kid? No. Uh, yeah, yes and no. I'm going to say uh, uh, I was a a strange kid. 
but now what what's the definition of strange again it's all relative I right mean, we, all, we all feel like we're strange because everybody's like weird is good right now it is well back yeah. then it wasn't easy <laughs> back then it, right in this in the 60s 70s it was not quite quite as my much. mom says i'm special right right well <laughs> it's not gonna help you right now <laughs> still gonna kick your ass <laughs> that's what's gonna exactly happen. <laughs> yeah 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 so you know, being a very tall skinny kid uh um i I was made fun of quite a bit because uh, kids are cruel to each other. We, you know, you you, you pick, pick the weak spot and you go for it. And what what got you? What was the weak spot? My long skinny neck, my neck, and it was I, walking into a room and having people just look at me because I'm taller than everyone else, I'm skinnier than everyone else, and and then t was nervous about that. So my behavior became kind of awkward, like, and so I would make funny faces and gesture with my hands to, uh, to try to get over, over that lump of, of nerves. And that made me kind of a, who is this freak? So, but thank heaven, I was able to hone that into a sense of humor that where I could control when and why they were laughing at me. Right. Uh, so I think that's where I know you'll find a lot of comedians, especially have this background where they got funny to overcome something right. in, in their life. I'm included in that. But you were picked on. You were picked on. Pick, picked on to a point. I, I, I was but never, never beaten up. Never beaten up. No. Uh, but 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 verbally made fun of to the point where my self image was completely skewed. I thought, How old were you? Mm, um, this is this is all this is from this is from kindergarten through you know the it, to the beginning of high school. Wow. Uh, uh, in high school, I kind of came into myself and and uh, was a little bit more. Um, that again that sense of humor had developed and that stage presence in the the, the plays and the drama department uh what got you into that but, uh, finding finding applause and and reaction from an audience that i wasn't getting in my personal life if that makes that, any sense it certainly right. does yeah, sure. uh, any actor can agree with that yes. probably. um you're not but, being accepted in this world but maybe right. it will be accepted in this world right because you know when uh, uh in a in a social setting my again being called an ostrich uh, and I, I didn't know what an ostrich was. I had to look it up. And I, when I saw a, a picture of an ostrich for the first time, I was like, oh, that's not a compliment at all. Jesus <laughs> when a human, bastards. Yeah, no. So uh, my long skinny neck and getting pictures taken from the side, uh, you know, for profile, I had a very weak chin. What you're looking at is a chin implant. I'm going to be honest with you right now. I have a half inch chin implant that I, really? got, I got in 1992. Uh, and I, it's a, I will never regret that decision to have, to have my, my chin enhanced. It by, looks fantastic. I would never know. It's not big now. What so, was it like before? So before it was like, I had a bottom lip and an Adam's apple and not much between. Really? So, yeah. So do you have pictures of that still? Oh, bad. Well, I, they're on paper. Thank heaven digital. It wasn't around then. So right, they're, they're not, right. they're not out there in the cloud anywhere. And this was 19, no. you get it fixed. Uh, 1992. 92. I had just finished Batman Returns, and I took some of that salary and and uh, put it into my chin. How much was it to get your chin redone? I got a good deal. I'm gonna guess ten grand. No, no, not even close. Uh, Doctor Akamazo was his name. I don't remember that. Uh, it was, he was a good doctor. He was a good doctor. Okay, remember and the good he was one. a sweetheart of a guy. Uh, referred to me by a nurse friend who had worked with him and had observed his operations, and she said, "Oh, he's, he's the guy you want." Uh, so I went and met with him and I told him like, I'm kind of on a budget. And he said, well, you know, I can, I can piggyback you on someone who's getting a facelift right before you. So, uh, so the, the room was paid for, but it was just his time and the, the, the material. So I got it all done for fifteen hundred dollars. One thousand. Well, now it would be ten thousand. Now it would be ten thousand. Yeah, yeah. Because it was so long ago. Yeah, nineteen ninety-two. Like, with inflation. Did yeah. you notice immediately you were happy? You were like, oh my! Like how soon I after? I never, you never once regretted. Did it. you cry? Oh yeah, when I first when they took the bandages came off, it was like that's what I've been praying for. Really? Yeah, you yeah, cried yeah. in front of the doctor. Probably a little, a little tear. I mean, it wasn't a heave cry. It was more of a <laughs> okay, it's working. Thank you, thank you for that. But uh, but mind you, uh, I I I I wouldn't say suggest going under the knife to make yourself feel better under every circumstance. This was something that had been nagging me since I was a kid. And every time I had a photo taken from a profile or my, or if I was on camera from, from the side, I would jut my jaw out to kind of compensate for my lacking chin. And that, that altered how I reacted, how I, how I met the world every day with right. my chin jutted out artificially because I didn't want anyone to see that I had a weak chin. You would literally do that. Oh yeah. Oh you gosh. Just, yeah. <clears throat> man. Yeah. So, uh, so it was affecting my, um, as an actor, it's like, I didn't want to have that nagging me every day. Right. So I just kind of, it's kind of like tucking your shirt in, you know, uh, I, I looked at it as like, well, it's, if, if my shirt doesn't look good out, I'll just give it a little tuck. So I kind of did that with my, right. with my chin. 
did a little thing and that's the, I've never gone back for more, you know, like, Oh, I want to get everything done now. Like, you know, those people in your, <laughs> oh, your course, watch once on, you start, you can't stop. Whoa, right. When you see those people. So, uh, <clears throat> I've never, never become that, but, but, uh, I love, I love, I love you, you know, I, I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking, uh, I have a deviated septum in my, in my right nostril. I mm -hmm. still have my nose strips. I wear nose strips overnight to breathe, but eventually I want to get it fixed. And the doctor's like, you know, you have this thing where your nose kind of like, see how it kind of smushes did your nose is do there that? much cartilage in there or? not a lot of cartilage yeah because like, mine's kind of firmer than that see yeah. mine's not firm so he's like well we're doing that i'd like to put a little piece in there which you wouldn't even notice it just raises it so your nose doesn't collapse as you get older uh -oh. <laughs> there's a thought so it doesn't get you know because you have one of those noses that could just like you it could end up going like, down where you're, yeah, you're like where it's meeting, you're meeting your upper lip yeah and you're like and i'm like but my friends are like, no, you're not getting a nose job. I'm like, I'm not getting. I have a deviated septum. Like, yeah, everybody says Everyone that. Everyone says that. Yeah. No, but I'm serious. I have a deviated no, septum. Right. But well, you're not going to Michael Jackson it. You're going to. You're talking. Yeah. All right. So that's okay. You're telling me I'm. I'll be fine. I should do it. You'll be fine. And you should do it. And now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. One of my favorite sponsors, by the way. Uh, Ryan, what does burnout mean to you? Not like you see these guys that are burnouts. <laughs> no, like that's a, different. It's completely different. Just uh, being depleted. Depleted uh, of energy. Overworked. Overworked. Not making enough time for yourself. Yep. Have you guys felt burnt out? I, I know I have. I constantly feel burnt out. It feels to me like I just don't have energy to do anything. And, you know, you've got to take time for yourself. You've got to pay attention to your body your mind and and better help is there for us ryan i know still uses better help a lot still of my listeners it. yep mm -hmm. listen to better help um life can be overwhelming <laughs> it sure can and many people are burned out without even knowing it symptoms can include lack of motivation irritability fatigue and more we associate burnout with work but that's not the only cause any of our roles in life can lead us to feel burned out BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to prioritize yourself. I don't know how many times I say this on the podcast. Be good to you. Be good to yourself. Talking with someone can help you figure out what's causing stress in your life. Um, I know that I get so in my head that I sometimes don't know what to do next. I don't, I'm overwhelmed with life. I'm overwhelmed. And I just tend to go back in the bedroom and just fall on my bed and try to sleep it off instead of dealing with my shit, mm -hmm. if I could say that. I don't think mm -hmm. BetterHelp cares. It's real stuff here I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But um, talking to a therapist, talking to someone, someone who's objective, someone who can, you know, who will listen to you, who's a professional, it helps. It really, truly helps. And um, don't take my word for it. Take Ryan's word for it. Take take uh, all, all the patrons and all the people around the world that use BetterHelp. Yeah. Take their word for it. Yeah. Um, BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, I can tell you that, especially living out here in California. You can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. And our listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash inside. That's BetterHelp, better, H-E-L-P dot com slash inside inside of you is brought to you by geico geico asks how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance well, of course you would after all who doesn't love a great deal right and when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life geico can help like with insurance for your car truck motorcycle boat and rv even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, add the easy-to-use GEICO mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance, and more. And choosing to switch to GEICO becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to GEICO.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. Do you, have you ever had a deviated septum? Nope. Yeah, my nose has been, it is what it is. You have a good nose. Thank you. You're <laughs> bless you. Are you a snorer? No, apparently not. Why do all snorers fall asleep first? You ever notice that? Not fair, is it? It's not fair. Yeah. And Mrs. Lori will not want me. See, this is what scares me about your show. This Lori deep, snores. This, this deep dive. I've talked about my fake chin, which I've never mentioned in public. And it's uh, a beautiful thing. Right. And now yeah. I'm talking about Mrs. Lori snoring. This is she. <laughs> 
<laughs> she's gonna hate this show. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> she's gonna hate this show. show. <laughs> ah, dear sakes. Yeah. Were your uh, were your parents very? What were they like? Did you have very uh, supportive parents? Were they like Doug? I love you. I'm proud of you. Were you, were they like that? Or they were? How were they? Yeah, they I mean, were. You, know, you notice the tone of my voice. Like yeah, mostly. Uh, uh, you know, Dad was very stressed. Uh, he he passed away at age fifty. I was only eighteen. So oh, wow. so Dad's been gone a long time since nineteen seventy nine. You were uh, eighteen. Yeah, about to, I was just about a month from turning 19. Were yeah. you guys close? Uh, getting closer finally. You know, because those those angsty teenage years, had had I was just at the kind of the end of that. I had gone away to college for my freshman year at right. Ball State University in Indiana. Ball State. They said Ball State. Don't get me. I don't want to take you off your train of thought. Yeah. <laughs> but they, I remember, there wasn't there a David Letterman mm -hmm. scholarship that if you had a C... You would qualify right. he did for the David Lyons right. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. And I actually went back to Ball State later uh, in more recent years. And I, I, I have the Doug Jones Endowed Scholarship Fund for the Theater Dance Department. Wow. And I wanted to do the same thing because I was not a, an, a straight A student. Neither, nor was and, I. And so I wanted to make it accessible to creative kids who are really talented who may not be academically on the same, you know, uh, high, high, high. Right. So at the time though, but their, their, their admission standards had gone up so much that that wasn't possible anymore, right. unfortunately. So I'm not sure what, what, what the Letterman scholarships did. Anyway, Anywho. Uh, but why, well, okay, we, uh, see. Your father, your father, your father, right? father, he, okay. You were, see, I, I listen, right? <laughs> you were 18, your father's 50 and he passes away and right. you know, you're getting the, closer. And I was at the end of my freshman year of college. I'd been, so I'd been away living in a dorm and living away from home under, under the parents' thumb for, you know, that, that, that whole the two semesters or whatever and uh and realizing like oh my parents aren't quite as dumb as i thought they were <laughs> right you know how you do when you finally get away from home and they were just looking out for my best interests and right. wow they really do love me and then he dies and it was so wait, I, I felt kind of unexpectedly oh yeah it was a sudden heart attack so it was like just a phone call in my dorm room one night guess what dad dad's dead uh, oh man was, yeah was, you'll never forget that no gosh no harrowing at that age you, you, you know because you think at that it, when you're 18 everyone's gonna live forever you know in your mind yeah uh I'm, it's just scary to get that call and we we all could get that call like that any minute with anybody you never know it's just so unpredictable right. yeah go yeah, ahead yeah yeah that's the unfortunate uh, uh, uh reality of the human experience is that it's it's temporary right right, <laughs> right. the yeah the fleshy part of us anyway and so, uh, but dad was a self-made fellow. Uh, he, um, he was very type A personality, very high stress, high strung. The heart attack didn't surprise me once I figured it all out, you know, right. uh, horrible diet in the seventies. Workaholic. Workaholic. Didn't know about cholesterol back then. Uh, and, uh, and he was, uh, you know, uh, quick to temper and he was a very high strung, but you know, as a, uh, he started his own business, a consulting firm. He also was in local politics uh, as a state legislator in our, wow. in our state government. A lot to look up to, right? Like, oh, gosh, to, yeah. Uh, he was quite a public figure locally, yeah, right. for sure. And he also uh, started a church in our living room. Uh, <laughs> this, is back in, this is back in the charismatic movement of the 70s. So like some Pentecostal hoo-ha. Uh, we broke away from the Methodist church so, so that uh, for a bit more uh, uh, freedom. Right. Uh, and so that's, so he said, let's just start a church in our house. And it grew to a, a high school auditorium with hundreds of people. So, wow. so he, he was a success at everything he touched, but it came at a cost. It came at a cost. So he, he drove himself to a heart attack at 50. Did you learn from that? Did you think these are the things I'm not going to oh, do? I'm yeah. not going to put myself through this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, every day I've passed 60, I wake up going, God bless. Here we go. You know, this is another, Gratitude. A, a gift of another day. Yeah, that, that dad didn't have. Right. 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 What do you do to stay healthy to stay on top of things because because with the business and all these things going on and the stress you could easily crumble we all can mm -hmm. i do mm -hmm. <laughs> but um so what, what is it you do right well uh i think you know it's funny i think the the uh the the, the lockdowns of the pandemic in 2020 kind of taught us all who we were you know uh, some people uh became a monster some people bettered themselves it just you know <clears throat> Uh, some people went, yeah, went down a spiral and other, others went up. Uh, uh, so I think I, I found myself working out more at wa and watching my diet. I've, I've been watching my cholesterol all my life now since, since dad died, I started looking at animal fats and, and, uh, you know, 
and uh, and whatnots going and sugars going. Oh, geez, that's. Do nice. you drink sodas? I mm, no, I really don't. Okay, don't keep it in the house. Don't really. Do you drink sodas, Ryan? No. Yeah. Oh God. Look at the ingredients. I've child. got to. I was yeah. just with. I was just talking to new, this new doctor. I got a physical uh, two days ago. Yeah. And he goes, I go, is it bad? Like if I just have like one soda a day? He goes, oh yeah, yeah, not good. <laughs> No good. Stop soda. Well, your doctor's Guillermo del Toro? He is. I don't know who he was. I was just throwing that out there. But I try. It's hard. But I think that, you know, you know, someone like me with neck problems, back problems, it's like, you know, the more inflammation you put in your body, the more pain you're going to be in. So mm. if you eliminate the sugar, as you eliminate the shit, you're going right. to feel better. Right. So why doesn't, why don't I just fucking do it? Right. 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 I think yeah. I'm in and out of doing it. Maybe take some turmeric and some cinnamon. Do you do that? Those are all, oh yeah, those are, those are all anti-inflammatories, natural ones. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I think yeah. I'm allergic to turmeric. Are you? Yeah. I think oh. I am. Mm. Isn't that a shame? No, oh, there's anything yeah. else up your sleeve there, Doug? <laughs> <laughs> what was the, um, by the way, I didn't know you were a contortionist. Well, should I, mean, I have known that? No, no one should know that. No. Uh, and what no does that should... mean, really? I mean, because you think contortionist, you think of somebody a circus it, act. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, right. What is a contortionist? You think of someone who can, yeah. Uh, well, basically, uh, no, I am not stretched, but I can, you know. Wow! When I am, you can I, blow yourself. I can put much. my, I can, that, put my I can put both my legs behind my head, and every guy asks that question. So can you? Can you blow yourself? Right. And yeah. if, if I answer yes or no, it, it, it comes with implications. Just a personal it mean, thing. It means I tried. It means that yes, I'm. What's not, wrong with you? But we've all tried. Trust me, <laughs> we've all tried. Have we succeeded? <laughs> not quite. Uh, well, you're not a contortionist. So you could just so, put your, uh, your for the most part, my, my legs behind my head. I'm a one trick pony when it comes to that. You know, I can also smash down. I found a way to configure myself into smaller boxes. So I did a couple commercials back in the day. I've done over a hundred commercials. I started as an actor in commercials. Hundred commercials. Yeah, back yeah. And uh, so I, um, a couple of them involved getting into like we're going to smash you into a box. One was a, a, a an e Lee Easy Fit jeans uh, where I got into a, a glass box and it was you know, from standing six foot three into like a twenty four by twenty four box. Uh, was kind of fascinating to watch. Even when I looked back at it, I was like, how did I do that? Did you like doing it? Did you like doing all these things? Well, I Did girls it, like it, these things? It was, it, <laughs> you know, I have been with Mrs. Laurie since college. So, wow. so uh, 38 so, years. So girl likes these things. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. She, yeah, we've been married for, uh, we got married in 1980. Four. 84 so you've been married for 16 26 36 30, 38 years a april's 38 years for us yeah yeah wow yeah that's what old people say she's seen you in <laughs> highs and lows have oh yeah yeah well we met in college when neither of us had anything had nothing really yeah. going on yeah yeah so that's uh I, that's been a blessing for me to to know i don't have to worry about is is this person interested in me because of x y or z or right because what you know, are they wanting to take advantage of me with mrs laurie i know mm -mm, we grew together you yeah. know from the even with beginning. the snoring even <laughs> especially with the snoring and i'll tell you why because <laughs> the happiest sounds for me are when she's in the other room watching tv and laughing Aww. it's like the happiest sound to me because like, i'm not responsible for anything right now she's happy she's <laughs> she's she's giggling good and when she's snoring it's also like mm life is good for her right now she's she's at rest she's at peace she's dreaming about something fantastic uh so yeah i i take uh, mrs Lori's happiness and her future and her retirement and all these things are like that was the thing that concerned me the most in life in my real life right yeah what was your first big break because you're doing a lot of commercials and things but what was the first thing as a you know as an actor you felt okay this is this is this is a cool thing this is a big thing uh but we, it, it was in it was in the TV commercial world. Uh, my first, I would say, I, my fourth TV commercial booking was the Mac Tonight campaign for McDonald's, which turned into, it was a regional uh, campaign that was four, four spots running in California. And then it became, ooh, National McDonald's is like, is interested because it was doing sales figures that it was the after 4 p.m crowd we were c catering to it was like a big crescent moon head that sang at a panel when the clock strikes hey half past six babe ho so it was a nightclub character uh and so uh it so then it went national right. and then it was so successful nationally that it went worldwide in other countries so i ended up working doing 27 commercials as mac tonight so you a, made a lot of money in a three-year period yeah so a lot of that's money what i bought my first house with yeah Wow. Yeah, it was McDonald's. I owe, I owe them that. 
So even though I can't eat there now, my heart. Right. But, but <laughs> yeah, with your cholesterol. But, but, you know, but they have they have some menu items you can do. I don't want to. Yeah, I can have a salad. Why can't you have you a can salad? Always get a salad at McDonald's. Yes, you have some you nuggets. Wait, right. Wait, wait, wait. I don't know. If nah, that's, that's, that's yeah. kind of the deep fried. Mm, yeah. Is your is not your friend? But what was the big, what was the big the the movie or the TV show or whatever it was right. that was right? Well, well. Uh, the Mac Tonight campaign is where I've started meeting and learning uh, about the creature effects people in Hollywood land. Uh, and so a lot of, a lot of creature effects people from different big shops came and worked on, on these different commercial shoots with us. Over and you were interested the, in that? No, I was interested in being a goofy sidekick on a sitcom. That's why I came to Hollywood land. I wanted to take, put my tall, skinny ostrich neck to work. Right. New chin. Right. And my new chin. Right. Uh, and so I did not realize that, uh, that this, you know uh, creature effects rubber bits on on actors was was really a career option right i didn't seek it out but once i had you know after my first agent had you know submitted me for all these roles that were physical tomfoolery and you know contorting or mime experience needed because they need a movement blah 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 those roles often came with a look that was glued on to you right, right? So that's how I started meeting creature effects people. And then that reputation, and, and they would go spread my name around their own community. And then come, I would get phone calls at home, sidestepping agents and casting directors. Hey, Doug, we're at the shop. We're, doing, we're working on this alien character. Would you want to come in for a quick fitting to see if it's going to be good for you? So I would. And then once it was a good fit, then then every all the business people would get involved and it would become a booking. So wow. so kind of so my career kind of So people like you. So people like you, Doug Jones. Well no, I, I don't I, want know, to boast. I just saw you in Arkansas at a convention and the first thing we just have a big hug and a kiss and just no. just friendly and mm -hmm. and you're just that guy. You're no. that guy. And it sounds to me like you've always been that guy. And that's why how your career started by being a good guy, easy to work with, and being talented at the same time. I suppose that's all it's all very important. Uh, uh being good at what you do is, is one thing. Uh, being nice while you're doing it is quite Quite another you know right. and not every not every actor gets that unfortunately you were never an asshole never an asshole phase uh, well you know i uh you would have to ask other people i, I don't think so right. i don't i don't think so did uh, you we'll get into it because i do want to ask you some questions because you, you're very honest you're very open so what was the first kind of big gig that you remember well, then, okay so outside of tv commercials um uh you because when, when you're a young actor when you get a booking and you you're like oh gosh i'm gonna do this movie you think this is my big break you, before you know how it's gonna do all the time right? and we all and then you learn and then you right then you think like this is gonna be huge it's gonna i'm gonna be the first name on the marquee well but you know <laughs> my my first movie movie that i remember really being like notable to mention was was a, a night angel it was a horror night film night angel yeah night angel it played in uh it played in theaters for a week and then yeah, at least you were in theaters and then it went to the vhs right oh this is back in 1989 i think it was my one or 89 maybe, maybe it may have come out in now did you play a creature in this no i was a guy i was a goofy. you were just an actor i was i was the guy you were not in any i played the character that i came to hollywood to be which was the goofy sidekick at a at a at a, a high fashion magazine i was like well, like an office helper guy right wearing a baseball cap with my curly hair and that was before my chin by the way right. this is 19, <laughs> 1990 80 nothing and uh and i was just like the goofy guy that like uh, you know hey i'm best friend of the handsome lead man of the movie and when the devil lady comes to take his soul like she kind of uses me to get to him and uh, so i right. yeah anyway i thought oh I'm, I'm i'm killing it this is gonna be great well the movie of course you know again after a week in the theater nobody even heard of night angel right, right right so that's when i realized oh this is gonna be a longer road than i thought uh so really i did i kind of worked consistently for many years from 19 uh uh gosh 80 uh, okay i started in 86 i'm gonna say yeah 86 is when i started booking my first commercials and then i got uh, my you know a guest a guest role here or there on a tv show the you know, sitcom this uh one hour drama that but no real lulls no real down like months and months or a year there, without work no no I, i've had i've had month a month or two of lull going am i ever going to work again every actor goes through that am i ever going to work again is right. a phrase we've all said many times but uh but but overall looking back hindsight is everything it's like no you know i've uh consistently it's worked been pretty consistent over the years uh so um at, le at least my my sag pension plan says so right but um uh <laughs> but uh uh other than that, um, 
uh, where were we? Well, the transition, I guess, because this was your first big acting role, and then it went in the theaters, and then went to. So, how did you trans? What's the word? How did you uh, transition into? Did somebody see you and go, "Oh, he'd be great as a as, a, as this creature," or he'd be great as? A, how did that start? Uh, right. That would have been like I like I said from, from the commercial world. Mm, uh, then monster A or B in movie this or that uh so i think man gosh what was it called uh, uh dark tower was a, a movie with michael mm, landon no michael mm, well guess what jenny agater was the star he's gonna look it up jenny agater was the the lead actress in it and uh her husband in the movie died fell into a cement uh while it was wet built it <laughs> while a skyscraper was going up and uh, his soul came out and, and haunted her when the building was near completion because she pushed him uh, uh, into the cement years before. It all comes out in the story. Uh, Who are the, the director? No, the the, the lead, uh, the, the actor that I that I Michael Moriarty. Moriarty. Mo Michael I was going to say that. Yeah. Michael, I, I played the dead version of him. The, his, wow. His, his ghostly figure that came to haunt Jenny Agater for killing me. Right. And. Um, so so that was my first movie movie that i was that, that was i think night um what was it called dark tower came before night angel actually um and did you have to wear prosthetics for this i did i because i because i was like you know a haggard ghostly sunken version of michael moriarty basically do you want to see it there's a picture oh, yeah. oh is there really let me see that that's me how did you find that good it's, gosh it's the Webernet is wow. amazing, right? Yeah. Now, how was that? That was that looks like that was probably your first real big prosthetic piece, right? For a movie. For I, a movie. I had done them for commercials before that, yeah. So, but how did that feel going into that? Did you feel? You, how many hours did that take? Oh, it just takes hours. It always takes hours and and hours. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you just because you 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 know it, what do you do during those, that time? Yeah. Read. No, no, you can't. You can't. You listen really to music. You music, yes. Uh, tell stories with your makeup artists. They become your best friends. They you're, always you're with, do. You're with them all day. Always all, yeah. do. It's like it's like being in a barber's chair or or being uh, at a uh, uh, your bartender, right? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, it's so true. They're your therapist. The therapist. Right? Yeah, they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's all that. I might even if if it's if I'm in a chair and they're just working on my front side, I can maybe doze off. Maybe if they tilt me back a little bit. Uh, you like dozing off. Oh, I do, especially with you know, if you have a three a.m. call time for a long makeup job, and yeah, you'll I I do many jobs sleep deprived, so right. that's part of the deal. And makeups can be anywhere from two hours, like on Star Trek Discovery, they've got these pre-made, pre-painted uh, prosthetic pieces that are, get glued onto me and blended in. Saru, 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 yeah, Saru, accent on the ooh, yeah. Saru, Saru, uh, uh, and so it's it's two hours in that. Yeah, you that's actually not that's, as bad. Yeah, the human characters on Star Trek are in as much makeup, uh, much time in the makeup and hair uh, trailers as I am. So, uh, so it's not so bad, but then you, you know, if you're doing a head to toe creature, like, like Abe Sapien from the first Hellboy movie, uh, they got it. It was seven hours a day. They got it down to five hours a day for Hellboy two, the golden oh. army. So down to five hours a day. Is, is it a like, daunting hmm. thing to go to bed at night and know I have to wake up and be seven hours in makeup? Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Do you well, get anxiety? The, the, the word, yeah, tell the, me about that. <laughs> yeah. No, I wouldn't say anxiety, but I do. Uh, I, I have spent mo a lot of my career dreading going to work, you know, just because it's like, oh, I got to go through this. Even though, even if I, it's a project I love and I, and that's the end. The, if the end result is a product we'll be proud of, then I, I can go through the hell that it takes to make it. Because I, I did come up with a catchphrase. <laughs> few years ago i'm very proud of it's called <laughs> and it, it is uh let's you know, hear it pain is temporary film is forever so pain that, that, is temporary film is forever, and that's so true that has been my no life matter how it. you're feeling this is going to be forever so right. give your best okay that's yeah. A, that, that's mm -hmm. yeah so that's where i've been wow yeah you have to think though all those hours in the makeup trailer you get a little upset a little unnerved a little irritable a little bit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. seriously no 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 you're 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 just you're just a different specimen well, different, no. <laughs> a different kind of human i don't well i don't get antsy i'm not i'm not somebody who when i'm sitting still i don't have to fill that space with doing something you know right. how many people are like what, what do we think we should do i'm like i'm fine just sitting here <laughs> I, I am a boring human being really i can stare at a wall and drool and be completely content so that makes that translates into the makeup trailer really really well 
Do you have any uh, issues with certain prosthetics, certain things that you wore that give you that you developed a neck problem or or a or a, a foot problem or whatever kind of problem? <laughs> no, no, I never. Uh, Nothing. I, no, not. I mean, like. Yeah, I mean, there, uh, especially the more the more mechanical type. If you're wearing a big head that has, um, you know, uh, motors and things in it that are uh, that are uh, what the servos and things, like batteries and motors and things that are operating a, a puppeteered face, uh, that's more of a more of still part of a suit. It slips on you. They buckle it in, or they they velcro it, or they glue it down. Uh, but it's not really a makeup. Uh, when you're in something like that that can be heavy and can push on places and you come away with red marks. Yeah. But what's the heaviest thing you've ever worn? The no, heaviest the, amphibian? The, no, no, no. Uh, the adventures of Galgameth. It was a movie that ended up on the Disney channel back in the mm, mid nineties. I filmed it in 1995 and um, I, I played a, uh, a kind of a God, a, a, a kind and gentle, helpful Godzilla-like character. It's kind of a lizard guy who grow, grew from like uh, three feet tall all the way to 50 feet tall throughout the movie. So I was I uh, a little person named uh, Felix Silla. He was, um, Felix Silla was Cousin It. Is that the, that the hairy thing in Adam's Family, the TV series way back in the oh, day? Oh, wow. Um, and he, he passed away recently, bless his soul. Uh, he, uh, was, he was little Galgi. So he he did Galgameth from from spoon size all the way up to three something feet tall, and then when he grew to six feet something, that's when I took over the role and all the way to fifty feet. So uh, that that was heavy. That suit was one hundred pounds. I weigh one hundred and thirty five pounds. So so when you, when you're adding hundred pounds to a skinny guy like me, that was that was just hellacious to get through. How long could you? And you had to walk around with a hundred pounds on you. Well, walk around, emote, act. You know, be intimidating, be swiping. How at much time did they have before you're like, I can't do this? Well, yeah, we 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 would we would yeah. I the head came off often, you know, uh, during throughout the day, and it could. It wasn't glued onto me, so that was another suit, not makeup. Right. Uh, and uh, so that would be, yeah, that would be the most hellacious thing ever. Have you worked with directors who just you could tell aren't they have they're not respecting you? Oh yeah, I mean, like you're just like they're just bossing you around and telling you what to do, yeah. and like move over, we can see this. Make sure you do this. Yeah. I don't, yeah, like where you're like, fuck you. Yeah. But Doug Jones wouldn't say that. <laughs> I would, and that's why <laughs> I'm not. Uh, anyway, mm. but you've had those well, yeah, moments. Well, any actor has, uh, you know, uh, working with the director is like is like dating. You know, you, you you find the right the right click that fits and you're like, "Oh, that's really good." Guillermo del Toro is that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. click, right? Yeah. That when, fit. When when you have a, a you know, that symbiotic relationship that where this is working, you know, we understand each other. There's a shorthand. We don't have to say many words. Is that what that was working with Guillermo? Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, he uh he gives uh, he'll give me notes ahead of time before we start filming, you know, months, weeks ahead. And uh, and then he he really is he respects an actor he want he wants you to bring your own thing to it he 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 he, he, he cast you in a movie because of what you have to to bring so he doesn't want to he doesn't want to spoil the suit by adding too much of his own spice to it you right. know uh, that's a great director and so when when on when on set like for instance uh, let's go back to uh, Hellboy uh, Hellboy two the Golden Army we're filming right. there was a whole sequence that he was going to do a tracking shot around me uh, that was. Um, just, he wasn't going to cut away to anything. So he hadn't, it was going to, it was just a one shot scene quickly with me doing things with props, putting a contact lens in, spritzing my, my gills with things. And I was a fish man in that movie. Right. Uh, so, uh, (laughs) so as the, as the camera was, it was on a a circular track going around me and he wasn't going to get any coverage on this to cut away to something else. So he had to get all of this action done in a certain amount of time. So I was, so take one, I'm going through all of the beats that we had rehearsed and he at the end of take one he says cut doggy you're boring me to tears that's all i had to say and i knew exactly how to fix it so, really yeah 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 yeah. because we, once you know each other you're well, boring me to tears uh, right right in the shape of water uh, uh another fish man character i played for him um uh he might stop me at some point and go cut doggy ha 
a noise and I was like, got it. And I knew what to do the next time. What does that mean? Well, because we had talked about uh, the difference between those te- these two fishmen that I played for him. One is very intelligent and refined, gentlemanly, uh, uh, and the other one is an animal from the wild. Right. Big difference. Right. So, uh, so he would remind me, you're an animal. From, I don't want to see any guy, any human. I want to see the animal side of you. So, so if he saw a human reaction or gesture from me as the amphibian man in the shape of water, he would just go, doggy, ah, just to remind me, animal. Right. So wow. you, you develop a shorthand. Was there ever a moment where he just was so astonished by you and what you had done and brought to it that you you did something that <laughs> non-verbally, right? Mm. That he was like, doggy, what? Is, like, <laughs> he was so happy. <laughs> Does he get that way? Does he get kind of animated and happy? Yeah, about that he stuff? totally does. Oh, when he like he's he's he is such a a, a grown up kid. I love him. I knew that. I met. I noticed that about him the first time I met him on Mimic many years ago. Mimic back in nineteen ninety seven. He's he's a he's a big kid, and I think that's why he's such a great director and why audiences love him is because he he makes things that'll make the kid in him go ee, you get excited. Yeah, that's what he makes. He makes things that'll he'll, that will give himself a geek gasm. Therefore, we all get one when we watch his, his work. Yeah, but um, uh, yeah, no, uh, uh, Pan's Labyrinth. Uh, he, what a character that was! Too terrifying. Well, played, too, you played two I played characters. Two. I was the fawn, fawn and pale man and the pale man. Yeah. Right? And uh, when I was playing the fawn, I think it was uh, he came and kissed my forehead after a take. Uh, I'll never forget it because wow. uh, because well there were so many notes on that one um, because I I was playing a character that the fawn was part man part goat part tree he was like a common he was like a you know this fantastical you know fantasy character so uh, so and I was aging backwards when you meet me in the movie I'm more old and decrepit and I get younger every time you see me right until the very end so. That we were filming that first introduction scene, and I was old and creepy and kind of. Uh, and so for some reason, that first the, after the first take and what I brought to it, uh, uh, he just came over and kissed me on the forehead and said, "That's it. That's all my. Those are my notes." <laughs> so, really? Yeah. Uh, it does not feel good. So good. So good. Yeah, yeah. Well, he told me. He told me on Pan's Labyrinth after after we filmed for the first two weeks, he came over to me one. Uh, I was sitting in this weird chair. I had a tail sticking out of my butt, so I kind of had to. <laughs> I had a, a, like a bicycle seat with a T-bar that was padded that I, it was very uncomfortable uh, between takes on that, on that particular movie. Uh, I had, there was no way to really recline and I had, and the head had mechanics built into it with these long, huge horns, very heavy. So my little skinny neck was like, oh my gosh. But I'm sitting in that chair, kind of like taking a breather between shot setups. And he came shuffling over to me, put his hand on my forearm and said, Dougie, I know you have not heard much from me on this, uh, so far but uh it's because you're getting it right i'm like okay well i'll, I'll take that thank you <laughs> wow and i did know that but yeah less is uh, you know when you're not getting so much direction from him he it's it's him not wanting to ruin things now you had a lot of roles or some roles where you would go in and learn tons of dialogue there was one where you had to learn a ton of spanish mm-hmm. what was that mimic well, that, no that, that was pan's labyrinth that was pan's labyrinth the fawn spoke spanish so you he yeah. spoke spanish so you learned a great deal of spanish oh, all the exposition came from the fawn he had explained to little ophelia who she was where she came from where she needs to go how to save the underworld all that came from me in spanish in paragraph form it was like oh my god and then they well, cut it well, no, they didn't. They, uh, they replaced your voice. As I asked. Yeah. Right? And I you would, asked. I would never ask to have my voice replaced. But uh, but in Spanish, why not? Uh, because <laughs> I, mean, I, I told him, I, you know, I think you got the wrong guy for this movie because I don't I don't speak Spanish. And purely there's a Spanish actor who can pull this off way better. No, no, no. He, he told me that you can count to 10 for all I care, uh, but you got to play the phone. Because he had in mind what he need. He wrote the, the role with me in mind. He knew what he wanted. So... Were you terrified? No, I've never been more terrified of anything in my life than that particular movie. How long did it take you to learn all the dialogue? Months, months. Because uh, you're learning Spanish. Spanish, right. And it was, uh, so- Can but, you speak any of it now? Do you no, remember any yes, of it? Any no. of it? None of Soy it. Soy un fauno, vuestro más humilde subdito, majestad. That's the line I remember. Pretty uh, cool. <laughs> thank pretty you. good. Thank you. Thank Sounds you. great. So I- uh, So he gave me the option to just like, you know, like give the right, count to 10, like he said. But- I knew mm, I couldn't give him 
lip movement going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, diez. And then try to dub over that with lips not matching. Right. That would have been ugly. And then also you're playing, I was playing opposite a, an 11 year old actress who needed something more from me than one through 10. Right, she, right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes, of course. I, I mean, I would have been a disservice to her and to the scene, to the scenes, to uh, count. Was so, he very grateful that you did all that? I, I believe so. I, um, uh, I just I showed up knowing it all. So thank heaven. But I will say, as hard as it was to memorize dialogue in a language you don't speak, once you do know it, it comes out of you the same every time. Because in English, when you're memorizing English dialogue, uh, your native tongue you have a vocabulary full of options, right? Right. So, uh, uh, you know, like this, uh, oh, what would uh, adjectives and adverbs are where, where we get, I get hung up on, on like when things will come out because I have so many options to pull from. Right. Which was it again? Uh, 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 uh. But in Spanish, uh, or I also did a movie in French the same way. I played a creature uh, uh, version of, of Serge Gainsbourg as his alter ego in that in French, same thing. I, once you, once it's in there, it's in there that one way and you have no options. Right. So it comes out the same every time. So thank heaven for that. It just took, it just took a minute to get it in there. But you had experience. Was it, was it, um, surfer? The, uh, the silver surfer was that the one where they took out your dialogue well, and it pissed hey, you off it's ha it's ha it's happened twice in english it, out of my 36 year career i've been dubbed over in english twice and the uh, the unfortunate uh misconception is that doug always gets voiced over and because it happened twice and that's yeah, it's not, not the true re the rest of my career has been my voice uh and it but will, you also put it into a contract it's now a part of my contracts right i, I will not i will not be voiced over you again. got some clout in the industry in well, you got no, some respect maybe not or they might say f you doug and then i don't do the job so that's fine has that's, that ever happened no no thank heaven thank, thank heaven but but um i uh i uh uh I lost my train of thought again. Well, about uh, <laughs> this happens a lot. This ha at my age, this happens. You're a lot. not even old. Oh, child. but I lose my train of thought all the time. Yeah, but I was saying about the lines being dubbed. It's in your contract, right? That's it. Okay, dubbed over. Right. I, I it happened on Hellboy One, uh, and that was again. I was not. A, I was not a spe even a spec on the celebrity radar at that time. And this is 2003. So you couldn't really say much. Again, been working consistently, but I. But nobody. I did not have household name recognition at all. Right. So uh, David Hyde Pierce did. He was at the top of his Frasier game. That was in their final season. All right. And he also had a very distinctive sound in his voice. And uh, so, did so, it break your heart? Yes, that actually broke my heart. But I went into that job. I went into Hellboy knowing that they had a pre-discussion with the studio and Guillermo del Toro. Uh, he was the direct director of that as well. Uh, he told me uh, when I came in to, to discuss Abe Sapien with him, uh, he told me that day, they're talking about doing a celebrity voiceover, just so you know. And I said, oh, gosh, I would really rather you not do that. And he said, well, I'll, I'll campaign for you, if I, uh, but... But this is what this is what the studio has, and and I understand that this is a marketing thing, and I, that's above my pay grade. I don't know how, right. you know, whatever. So uh, attaching a bigger name to a role for marquee status or poster status, great. I get, I totally understand, but doesn't mean I like it. <laughs> yeah. And when I when I finished the role, uh, having delivered a, a, a voice that I was satisfied with for Abe Sapien, and that Guillermo was satisfied with for Abe Sapien, and everybody else was too. I did get a phone call two weeks after I went in for my ADR voice looping session to clean up my dialogue, which in that day went really, really well. I'm like, okay, I think this is going to stay my. Two weeks later, I got a phone call from Guillermo saying, uh, they, they, we were voicing it over with David Hyde Pierce. I was crushed. I, I, uh -huh. I, I'm not going to, a tear did run down my cheek on the phone uh -huh. with him, but uh but he he i i asked him is it a, was it a performance issue you know is it does it need to be replaced he goes nope it was not it was uh, you everyone loved what you did but david's got a name and a distinctive sound that that like they're they're hoping to sell and is so, that when you sort of went home and talked to Lori and said i'm not gonna allow them to do this again i couldn't come out and play anymore uh no yeah it happened because silver surfer came after that it came after so that right. was the, that was the final that was, that the, was the final the camel right spat, because right. i did not have the same the same heads up on the silver surfer uh, but but let me let me back up for a second I, I do want to finish up to say that david hyde pierce was quite a gentleman in this whole process he came in to do his adr voice looping session to, to dub over me he heard me in his earpiece, my original sound and and my 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 cleanup that I did in in, in my ADR session, 
And he said, what am I doing here? Which was very kind of him, wow. right? And so he he finished the job he was hired to do. And I thought he did a great job. He was great. I love him dearly. But uh, but then when the movie came out, his name is not in the credits. It's on IMDb, but it is not in the credits of the movie. And he did no press, didn't come to the red carpet premiere, nothing. And when asked why, he said it's out of respect to Doug Jones. Do actors do this for each other? I, I almost just cried right I know. now. That no. just almost hit me. Like That's it hit like me. the sweetest thing ever, right? What? Yeah. I've never met him in person. When I do, he's getting a kiss right here. Yeah. because He I, said, out of respect to Doug Jones, mm -hmm. I'm not allowing myself to be credited in this movie. Do you love, do you, I mean, do you believe that? I, 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 he said it. He said, it's amazing. No, it's amazing. So I, 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 I oh, adore him. Man. He didn't have to do that. And I, I wouldn't, I, 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 I would have been fine had he taken the credit for what he, the work that he did. Sure. Uh, so anyway, but then, and Guillermo del Toro also told me on that, that same phone call that if we do a Hellboy 2, that I'll be using your voice for that. And he did come through on that promise. That's right. I also did the, the, um, uh, the voice for Abe Sapien in the two animated films that came between Hellboy 1 and wow. 2. So, uh, so, it, it, and the video game. So my voice is out there. So you're doing just fine. You, you, worked it, things worked, worked out. Worked out fine. Do you yeah. consider your career to be someone, uh, similar not dissimilar to Andy Serkis in a way that right. such a great actor he is. And he's done a lot of these roles <laughs> that people are like, wait, that's him. That's him. Yeah. And then, you know, have you ever met him? Yeah. I mean, we finally met at San Diego comic con at an after party when I, he was talking to somebody. I was like, Oh my gosh. I went over and tapped him on the shoulder and I said, Andy, uh, Doug Jones. He goes, Oh, threw his arms out. Wow. And we both hugged each other for about five minutes, just giggling and then parting and looking at each other and ah, and then hugging again, yeah, it was uh, it was That's uh, awesome. it was lovely, and uh, yeah, we hung out for the rest of the evening, and it was just, uh, and we agreed on something that we both are are have have similar, uh, um, a similar image in the in the movie industry, but his makeup goes on after the fact, and mine goes on before. You know, that's the the only difference, really. Right. Know? That's amazing. Yeah. Because he does a lot of like motion capture, digital. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know exactly. Performance capture, yeah. right? Performance. For the capture. audience who may not understand what we're talking about, I'm just, right? <laughs> I knew you got it. Yeah, I yeah. was just taking it in. Yeah, I was yeah. taking it. Thank in. you. Thank this you. is called shit talking with Doug Jones. <laughs> These are questions, rapid oh, fire, if you like. Oh dear sakes! Uh, from my lovely patrons, hi patrons. Oh, oh, they support the podcast in many ways, and I love you guys. Go to Patreon.com/slash inside of you to support the podcast more, keep us afloat. Uh, here they are, Haunted John. Uh, what was a good memory from Hocus Pocus and how was it like to work with Bette? Uh, I've been a big fan of Bette Midler's before the movie filmed. Uh, she was on a, a hot streak at that in the nineties there with outrageous fortune and, and, uh, down and out in Beverly Hills and big business yes. and the, one movie after another, one hit after another and her huge recording career. I'm on my way to work my first day on Hocus Pocus. And what do I hear on the radio? From a distance. Uh, mm -hmm. One of her huge hits. Yeah. I work with her that night. She was delightful and goofy and uh, and uh, hilarious, and she had those buck teeth in as Winifred and no <laughs> eyebrows, and it's always right. it's hard to keep a, the giggles from coming uh, while looking at her that close. <laughs> and she was so so sweet. And then on the way home uh, on the car radio, I heard, uh, "You are the wind beneath my wings." Like she's huge, she's huge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was it was lovely, uh, and then reconnecting with her recently, I just did Hocus Pocus two, which is coming out on Hocus your, Pocus two. It's, it's coming out on Disney. Did Play. you just play the same character? I did. I, Billy, yeah, I reprised but Billy Billy Butcherson. Butcherson. Uh -huh. right. And so the four of us immortals from the first movie are the ones that came back for Hocus Pocus. What two, a treat! With a bunch of new kids. Twenty nine years later. I don't know how many sequels get made 29 years after the first no. one. But to have all four of us back and looking almost exactly the same as we did almost 30 years ago. Holy shit. Yeah, the, the, the ladies all looked fantastic. Uh, uh, and um, and I, I looked ex I looked like like seconds had passed because um, uh, in 29 years, because I was wearing a prosthetic, you know. Yeah, uh, and you didn't get fat. I have exactly the same weight, <laughs> exactly the same build as I was 29 years ago. So uh, it looked freakishly the same. And it was the same wig from the first movie. There was, wow. it was The wig had been sitting on, a, the... on on display at, at someone's creature shop, and they just took it off and put it back on me, and it was exactly the and same. And it fit perfect. It didn't shrink nothing. Nothing. Everything's Good the same. God. Everything's the same. Leanne P., of all the characters you played, which one do you identify with the most? Oh, right. Oh, it's like, oh, the toughie. Uh, uh, 
I, there, there are parts of me in all of them, you know, different parts. Like uh, the Silver Surfer, I loved his quiet, stoic, heroic thing. Those are things that I am not, but I want to be. I want to have the confidence that I don't have to flap my hands around when I talk like the Silver Surfer didn't need to. He just, he's just spoke. <laughs> um, uh, but, but I think that, um, um, hmm, the, 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 the intelligent characters that are very gentlemanly, I, I, I like to identify with like, like Abe Sapien and Saru from Star Trek Discovery. Very intelligent, very gentlemanly. They could also, they could also pass as a butler with their behavior. Is Star Trek the hardest dialogue you've ever had to learn? Yes, without question. Uh, when you're doing paragraphs of science fiction dialogue with terminology that is not in common day use. And how long do you have to learn it? Oh, you know, you know, when your scripts come out, you, couple days. you know what series television is like. You, you, you Sometimes it has been a couple of days. Now, in more recent seasons, uh, season one was like that. We would get rewrites at the last minute going, what? That's a paragraph I've never seen before. Do you learn dialogue quickly? No, I'm a slow learner. Uh, so what do they do? I mean, what, what, I mean, you just well, learn it somehow? Yeah, just kind of fear will drive you forward if you, if you use it correctly, I think. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Wow. It'd take it. But there's, there's a lot of outtakes too. Yeah. Where, a lot of fun stuff. Oh yeah. Where, where, where <laughs> I've, I've, you know, slammed a, a character to death. My P, what's the most challenging role you've played? Hmm. Most challenging. Right. Maybe physically, maybe mentally, maybe both. Right. 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 Uh, well, let's go back to uh, uh, those characters in foreign languages, the fawn from Pan's Labyrinth and, uh, and Le Gueule from uh, Gainsbourg, A Heroic Life, the French movie. Um, uh, I'm playing fantastical, heavy five-hour makeup applications with paragraphs of dialogue in a language I don't speak. So that's mentally, physically, emotionally, and then having to, you know, play a, um, an arc of emotion, you know, and, and character development and relationship status with someone else in the movie, da, 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 whatever it is. That's a, that's a lot to take on. Yeah, so those, those would be the challenges. How fun was what we do in the shadows? What Funny we do in the shadows is... By the way, I, I didn't know it was you, and then I saw and I go, whoa! Ah, but you were you. terrific. I think I texted you or emailed you. you. I was like, you, did. you are phenomenal. Did yeah. you see it? The what we do in the shadows. Well, yeah, 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 of course. The series. Yeah, yeah. he did Oops. an episode, and it was just, it blew me away. Well, actually, I've done several episodes now. Uh, between I don't know how far you've caught oh, up. Oh, no, I, I have. I only saw the one I'm, that you I'm were in. Up. Okay. I keep looking at him. Look at look at that. Well, just keep it off for a minute, for God's sake. We're almost done here. (laughs) So, um, uh, 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 yeah, no, uh, season one and season three, and I just did an episode for season four. So uh, that'll be coming back uh, as the Baron 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 Afonas. What a great character! Uh, He's kind of like a play on Nosferatu. I think he's kind of like old old world. uh, He's the old world uh, uh, vampire that is coming to check on these doofus kids and that I've, that I sent to conquer the new world north america and they've never made it out of staten island so uh so to, the the show is so absurd and so lovely have i have such a great time on it i you go to work and you laugh all day and everyone on the show is. Do they let you improvise at all? They encourage it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you'll do a scripted take or two, and then they say, "Here's the fun one." And they, they, oh, and the series regulars know what to do with that too. They go all over the place. Did they let? Did you? Do you remember saying anything just off the cuff, and it was, it was in the show? Oh, uh, uh, from. Hmm. Because well, my my one big episode in season one was the Baron's Night Out, where the entire episode was all about me. Uh, yep. And. Oh, I don't remember much. I was terrified of, of that because it was so. I was doing Star Trek at the same time, and I had they had to borrow me for a couple of days. So I was like, I was I don't remember, exhausted. Don't remember much about it. Yeah, I did have an improv moment in the in the most recent one that I just filmed. That will, will I have yet to see if they're going to keep it. But I, but I, funny I, stuff. I I winked at myself, going, Doug, that was pretty good. Yeah, and they liked it. People <laughs> were like, oh, awesome. yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a chuckle from the crew. Yeah. So, <laughs> so. Uh, last question: What was it like? Uh, playing one of the gentlemen in my opinion one of the best episodes of buffy the vampire slayer buffy the vampire slayer yes i was the lead gentleman uh in that and, and do you keep anything from sets ever yeah uh, uh boy i wish i'd started that a long time ago before i knew that the the secondary market that was out there <laughs> to, sure. to sign and sell these things yeah uh but no i uh I, i've kept some prosthetic piece face pieces like if when they remove it from me i'll maybe take it home in a plastic bag i have a few of those but they're not on display anywhere i'm really bad at that you should do i know it. i've got a pile in the Look corner at my house i know i know it's great this is great it's a museum i know that's I, why I i'm single i, I need to <laughs> Pretty much. I need, I need to to do this to a room. But you like doing Buffy. It was fun. 
I did. It was fun. And it was, uh, the Hush episode has been a fan favorite over the years. That and the musical episode for the Buffy fans out there uh, are the two that I hear the most about. So I, I'm really tickled pink. And to, to be a guest star on one episode of a show and then have it live this long after, that was 1999. And so here we are, you know, 20 some years later and people are still talking about it. And uh, so that, that, that means the world to me. And it was directed that episode, you know, as, as TV episodes go, I, every uh, every episode is directed by someone different. Uh, so that episode was was directed by Joss Whedon himself, the creator of the wow. show. He wrote the script. He directed it. So we knew it was special for him to come out of the office and and put his hands on, into that one. Right. Uh, and so to to take the vo uh, verbal dialogue away again, I, I stole everyone's voice in Sunnyvale for that episode and uh, and did our dastardly deeds in the quiet. And uh, when we heard a human voice, that's when our heads exploded at the end of this episode. So. That was daring and, and innovative television. Yeah. And uh, again, visual storytelling without verbal dialogue. And it was an exercise in that too. Where great. do you see yourself? Like uh, you're 60, right? I'm 61. Oh God. I'll be 62 in May, child. Uh, yeah. yeah. Where, do, you, do you think, do you, do you want to retire ever? Do you think, oh, you know, when, when I hit 65, <laughs> I'm done. 70, I'm done. Yeah. When do you think you've had enough? Like I just, I've had enough. Well, or would you always be open to something if it came along? I'm always going to be open to something. I, I I want to Betty White this if I can. Right? Really? Yeah. I mean, if I if I can be 99.9 .9 and still working uh, like she did, I would be uh, tickled pink with that. But the rubber bits and the glue and the mechanics that will stop. That that needs to phase out at some point. I'm 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 I'm, uh, I'm being far more picky with those roles now. Uh, so you might have a couple years left of that. I think maybe. Uh, so well, I have to get him while he can. Yeah, I'm going to finish out my Star Trek uh, uh, contract uh, for however many seasons we're going, and uh, and then we will see. We'll see from there. But I, I really do want to explore more human characters exactly and um and as uh, you should I, and I, i've played several over the years that just you know but you know those that are less memorable and people don't you know well when you play a role in shape of water and you went to the oscars right it did yeah yeah oh, it was man. great oh what a didn't magical. it win best picture it did jesus man best picture with a monster on the cover is was un unusual and that's you it was unusual yeah, yeah see you should have that poster up in your house i should i should i should you should it. frame it in a beautiful frame and I just know. have that that's me this is okay yeah seriously yeah, yeah. they got the wrong creature in that movie that movie doesn't win an oscar <laughs> you i mean that was just the your acting in that oh, was just superb bless you, bless you. Thank it you. really is uh you're a superb human being you as are you michael Rosenbaum. i loved I having you here today adore you and i guess i'm not so scared after all see it worked out okay this is easy okay huh? it's ryan okay. you should be nervous about <laughs> right that mustache right, right. that's right Jeez, it's like keith hernandez from the mets that's right. Yeah. yeah uh thank you i love you i love and, you more uh, i hope you come back Let's do it. Let's okay. do it. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Doug Jones. Uh, wonderful interview. I loved having him on. He's so gracious. He's so sweet. And uh, I love his story. And uh, very few people work as hard as Doug Jones. It's true. I'll tell you that. Yeah. He, uh, man, that is a, it's a very specific and very enduring talent. Yeah, it is super, super. Such an actor. A test I mean, of endurance. Yeah. You know, I saw him in uh, what we do in the shadows, the series, and uh, I think oh, we talked right. about that. And he was just genius. And I go, wait a minute, it said Doug Jones. That was Doug. Oh, he so was funny. brilliant. That's so, so funny. Uh, thank you, Doug. Um, also, just want to uh, throw out another um, mention to the animal rescue mission that rehabs and finds forever homes and for abused and neglected animals. Go to www.theanimalrescuemission.org. Uh, and donate. Um, also, uh, don't forget to follow us um, on the podcast. The handles are at Inside of You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, and at Inside of You Pod on Twitter. Um, you could watch on YouTube, and please subscribe and write a review if you like the podcast. That's all. That's all I'm asking. Um, and you can listen to the intro, and it tells you where I'm going to be. Um, for I'm going to be in Raleigh um, this weekend. I'm going to be in Boston, August 12th weekend, with Tom signing autographs. Uh, also, the Inside of You online store. Go there for some cool stuff. Patreon, join Patreon. We're about to do one of the the, the perks of being a Patreon is uh, the top tier patrons get shout outs on the podcast, which I'm about to shout out all these glorious people who really help the podcast and keep it afloat. And uh, it means the world to me that you guys uh, give to the podcast. Um, it's a little, the little podcast that could, is that what I call it? Mm -hmm. 
and it keeps going. And uh, I appreciate Ryan still being here with me. Mm. We try to have a good time every week. We have a good time. We do. We do we have do. a good time. We both deal with anxiety and we both, <laughs> you know, we're living life. And, uh, we're having a great time. What do you mean? Well, this is super. This is awesome. Uh, but uh, anyway, I love you all. Um, and thank you, patrons. Here's a shout out to all the patrons. And uh, here we go. Nancy D, Leah S, Sarah V, Little Lisa, Yukiko, Jill E, Brian H, Nico P, Robert B, Jason W, Kristen K, Raj C, Joshua D, CJP, Jennifer N, Stacy L, Jamal F, Janelle B, Kimberly E, Mike uh, E, correct, yeah. Eldon Supremo, 99 more, Ramira, Santiago M, Chad W, Leanne P, Maya P, Maddie S, Belinda, N, correct, Chris H, Dave H, Sheila G, Brad D, Ray, H, correct, Tab of the T, Tom N, Suzanne B, Liliana A, Talia M, Betsy D, Chad L, Marion, Meg, K, correct, Meg K, Dan N, Big Stevie W, Angel M, Rhiannon C, Corey K, Dev Nexon, Michelle A, Jeremy C, Andy T, Gavinator, David H, C, C, yeah, it was a tough one, Damn. John B, Brandy D, Yavor, Camille S, The, C, Joey M, Design, M, mm, O, T, G, correct, Eugene and, uh, Leah, correct, Chris P, Nikki G, Corey, Katie B, Nicole, Patricia, Heather L, Jake B, James B, Megan T, Mel S, Orlando C, Caroline R, Rob E, Paul C, Christine S, Sarah S, Eric H, Jennifer R, Shane R, Emma R, Mark M, Jeremy V, Andrew M, Robert G, Zadoichi 77 did I say that right? Zadoichi Andreas N, Alexandra, Chris R, Michael F, Samantha W, and Michelle D. I couldn't do it without all you guys. Thank you for supporting the podcast. Thank you for being a lovely patron. I'll be on one of those YouTube lives soon. And I think I'm doing a thing with the top tier patrons. I'm going to do a Zoom for the top tier patrons. We're going to all Zoom together. Um, uh, I think it might be it might be tomorrow. Look on the patron thing and uh, hopefully I'll be there. But uh, look, from uh, myself here, Michael Rosenbaum in the Hollywood Hills of California. Hello, I'm Ryan Taz as well. <laughs> in the Hollywood Hills of California. <laughs> That's Ryan Taz. <laughs> and uh, we always have a nice time here. We appreciate you uh, hanging uh, with us. This is uh, this is always great. And um, I feel like my mood is better today. Yeah. I feel like I have my, you know, I'm getting back to my old self. And uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for all the support and love and people checking in on me and all that jazz. And uh, follow me on Instagram at the Michael Rosenbaum. Follow Ryan. At Taya's Ryan. I'll, At Taya's Ryan. I'll post every couple of months. Yeah, he'll do it. But, you know, follow him anyway. Yeah. We, we love you. Thank you for the support. A little wave to the camera. And uh, be good to yourself. Please be good to yourself. And until next week, um, I'll be I'll be waiting for you.